Welcome to the Mixology Talk Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Julia. And we're the folks behind abarabove.com, the ultimate resource for craft bartenders, bar operators, and just about anybody else looking to make great craft drinks. I'm a bar consultant with more than 10 years of industry experience. And I run abarabove.com, bringing weekly articles and cocktail recipes to help you make great drinks and grow your career behind the bar. Hey everyone, this is episode number 104 of Mixology Talk Podcast, and this week we're catching up on some listener questions. We have some really good ones this time, talking about everything from cotton candy vodka and getting paid for your cocktail recipes. So let's check it out. So our very first question comes from Stephen from Davis, California, and he has some uh, pretty strong feelings about flavored vodka. He says, I don't get it. Why bother with flavored vodka? Straight or in a vodka martini, maybe. But otherwise, why not just use vodka and mix in some real vanilla or juice or even cotton candy? It seems to me they're just novelties to sell spirits that will end up in the back of the shelf collecting dust at home or in the market. Great for the vendors catching a fad, I guess. Ouch. Yeah, no, like it. I'm like glad you I said. don't make cupcake vodka. I know, I would I'd be hurt. My little cupcake filled heart would be hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but Stephen makes a couple of good points, and I think there's a couple different ways you can look at this, this statement. And I really want to call out the fact that he's definitely not alone. I think a lot of people share this sentiment, myself included, frankly. I don't really care for overly sweetened flavored vodkas as well. No, and I don't particularly care for them. I know there's a place for them in our industry and you kind of got to pick your battles. If your clientele are asking for cupcake and cotton candy flavored vodka, well, we're here to serve our guests. And they're the ones with the, uh, the tips. Yeah. And so, I mean, if it makes sense with your concept, of course, then if it's something that people are asking for a lot, then might as well carry it. I know bars that don't carry some pretty mainstream spirits like Tangeray or Kettle One because of their own style and that's okay. That's totally okay. But they take the risk that they're gonna lose business over it too. Right. And I think that's exactly the point here is is as a there's three different perspectives here. A consumer perspective, a bar perspective, and like you mentioned, the sort of supermarket liquor store perspective. I can't speak for the liquor stores, but I can say from a consumer perspective, I think people buy these ingredients because there's just a marketing factor to I'm sorry, but if you don't know anything about anything straight out of college. Straight out of college and something says cupcake flavored, like I'm in. <laughs> I'm so like sprinkle fl- I don't even know whipped cream, like I mean now that we know how this stuff works, it like kind of turns my stomach, but like I get it. If you don't know anything about cocktails, like, it seems like a pretty safe bet is going to be something that's supposed to taste like cupcakes. So I've never admitted this before, and I, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to clear the air here. We're going to have a little marital counseling little on the bit. line. So uh, hopefully no judgment will uh, fall upon my shoulders, but that's okay. I'm sure it will. No promises. We're bartenders after all. That's what we do for a living. <laughs> I definitely went through the stint of having flavored vodka, every possible flavored vodka under the sun, and we would go camping, and I would have flavored vodka of whatever flavor it was, and 7-Up, and it was pretty damn good. Was when this I was, before you were bartending? It was right in the beginning when I was bartending, but you also have to understand that Mixology has taken leaps and bounds from where it started. Yeah, what year was that, too? That was, oh, man. It was man. like three months ago, wasn't it? It was Sunday. No. <laughs> No, this was, man, this was pretty early in my career. So it must, it must have been have 10, been 12 years ago. 2005? Okay. Maybe before the podcast. 2003? Saying that changes everything because, to your point, things have changed a lot. Yeah. And I was actually talking to Julia about this before the podcast. And many people may not realize it, or it might have just been my own perspective, but. There was a time where mixology and craft bartending, it was all about flavored vodka. Whatever you can possibly get your hands on, throw it on the menu, you know, do a couple of spins on classics like Blood Orange Cosmos were everywhere. Well, I think that we as an industry actually kind of owe a lot to flavored vodka because if you think about it, flavored vodka in a lot of ways threw open the door to the cocktail revolution. And I'm certainly not super knowledgeable in the history of the cocktail revolution. But from my perspective, what I was seeing was wine, beer and wine, beer and wine. And then suddenly there started to be some cocktail options out there that interested me. And yes, they all use flavored vodka. But you know what? I grew out of that. And a lot of people grew out of that. And I think that it really I think flavored vodkas kind of brought a lot of consumers 
over to ordering a cocktail rather than ordering wine and beer. Yeah, it's like the candy-soaked gateway drug of the spirits world. <laughs> I have no words. <laughs> <laughs> But it is. It, it, to your point, it, it definitely gets people interested in kind of what we do, how we craft cocktails. And if that's how you kind of get your hands, if you open up their eyes and say, look, there's a better way, you know, sure, you take shots of fireball all day long. But I actually made this fireball from scratch in the house, you know, whatever, house made fireball. Yeah, if you like fireball, you might like this. <laughs> right, exactly. Can I make you something I think you will like? I mean, and that's circling back to your real question. Yes, there's a lot of history there, but setting aside the history, like turn it back onto the customer experience. If a customer comes to you and they're asking for, I don't know, some ridiculous shot that uses these ingredients, then why not offer them something you think they'll like based on what they asked for? I mean, this is where you get to be the expert and where you get to throw open that door and introduce them to something they may not have had before. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, But again, we don't get to choose what people want. As bartenders, we may want to and we may look down on them in shame and, and there sadness. there was a time in our industry where that was the norm. Absolutely, but we don't get to do that. I think, remember, we're in the business of giving people great guest experiences. And what that means is they order what they order. And you can certainly make a recommendation. But if they order something that you don't love, kind of too bad. So yeah, do the best that you can. Work within the boundaries of the concept and try to make as many people happy as you can. That's kind of what we're in for. And I would highly recommend not ordering something that has cupcake vodka in it, Stephen. <laughs> I don't know Davis bars very well. I know there's a lot of bicycles in that area. A lot of bicycles. A lot of bicycles, but I can't help you on the uh, cupcake vodka. So the second question comes from Erica B. And she writes, this is actually a question that we get quite a bit. I have a cocktail I made up. How do I get it out there on menus and get paid for it? This is a really, really great question. Like, like Chris said, we do get this one a lot where somebody has invented a new, brand new cocktail and they would like compensation for that. And unfortunately... There just isn't a market for it. I really, I wish I had something else to say here, but there just isn't. The deeper we get in the industry, the more it sort of reinforces this. I mean, think, imagine you were to walk into a restaurant with a fantastic cheesecake recipe and to try to sell them that recipe. It's kind of a long shot, right? And so that's kind of where you're coming from here. Just like the chef in a restaurant likes to make all his own recipes, so do the bartenders in a bar. Yeah, and... I mean, you could kind of put a twist on it and try to publicize it yourself, but you're probably not going to get very far. I hate to say it. Well, and actually, an additional problem here is that while I don't know the details, and I'm certainly not a lawyer, but my understanding is that recipes are not copyrightable. So if you invent a recipe and you publish it, it can be copied, adapted, or anything with pretty much no repercussions. So it's really very, very hard to protect a recipe. Yeah. And I think you wrote an article about this. Entirely likely. Yeah. I think we published an article around this many, many, many I'll months ago. I'll have to look that up. It'll definitely be in the show notes. What episode is this? This is 104. 104. So what would that would be? Show notes would be mixologytalk.com slash 104. Perfect. But yeah, to kind of summarize everything, there's a couple other ways to get paid for this. Obviously, become a bartender and craft your own cocktail menu. That could be one way of getting paid for your time uh, for creation. Right, because you're you're going to be clocked in, right? I mean, so so as a bartender, when you are, you know, before guests arrive or, or between shifts or whatever, if you're working on the cocktail menu and you've obviously spoken with your management, letting them know you are working on your cocktail menu, you can certainly get paid for that time. Yeah, uh, you're not going to earn any residual income by any means. Not You're not going to get a dollar for every time somebody buys your cocktail. So there's no Unless your bar has some awesome program going on. I have definitely heard of some really interesting creative programs like that, but it's few and far between. Yeah, it's very rare. The other thing you can do is if you're really good and you love creating cocktails and you've worked in the industry and have a lot of credibility, uh, you can become a cocktail consultant. There's a lot of places that are opening up that need very talented people creating cocktail menus. And they might need them quarterly. You know, you might need them with every change of season. There's a lot of need out there. I think the, the trick is going from not being a consultant to being a consultant. It's a big jump. It's a pretty significant jump. However, if you're not going to go quite that crazy, there's another perhaps lower stepping stone. And that is, Chris mentioned this to me. There is a service called CocktailCourier.com. And it might not be this one. It might be a couple, a different variation of this model. Basically, what they do is, this is a for consumers, consumers will actually order a 
cocktail delivered to their house and i don't know if it's pre-mixed or not or some combination it's kind of like um, my understanding is it's like blue apron um and i haven't done blue apron before but they ship you all the ingredients and then you make it yourself okay right. but what happens is they'll do a monthly or quarterly i'm not sure which competition for bartenders to invent the recipes it'll be on the following season's menu and if you win and your recipe is chosen you get some portion of the proceeds i have no idea what portion i don't imagine anybody's getting rich off this but it might be a fun thing to submit your recipe to yeah and there's a couple out there if you just look up cocktail delivery subscription i'm sure you'll find a ton of companies that are built off this model it may be worth approaching them and say hey i got a couple of fun recipes it'll only i'll only charge you a million dollars for each one and see what they say i don't recommend that pricing no no you have to get them on a phone to you know really accentuate the million chris doesn't have a lot of clients okay yeah you're right but that could be another avenue but other than that your options are fairly there's limited. one more idea it's a little bit crazy you could write a lot more recipes and put it together into a book. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I know it's a little bit of a long shot, but you can certainly publish your own recipe book nowadays. There's a lot of ways to self-publish, and this is certainly a little closer to residual income. It can certainly be challenging, and my gosh, it's a big project, but the uh, the world is your oyster. Yeah. If you're going to be making a ton of cocktails anyways and drinking them. They're now a write-off. Well, there you go. Sign me up. Ask your accountant. I think we've already done that. I think we've already <laughs> done that. And our accountant doesn't approve. So the third question is actually our very first question from Estonia. Ooh, I'm excited. I know. And actually, the same question was submitted several times over the course of the last week. I get an email anytime somebody submits a podcast question on our website. So this one is from uh, Cheap Cialis in No Prescription Estonia. Interesting. I've heard of that place. Yeah, exactly. And, and the question, basically, I'm summarizing a little bit here. But the question was basically, cheap Cialis, Viagra, no prescription, lose weight, diet pills, no prescription. That doesn't sound like a question at all. That sounds like a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm messing with you. We get a lot of spam on our podcast question form, and this one was particularly exciting. It came from Estonia, and uh, I think they were promoting like mango steens or something. For, the new wonder fruit drug. For weight loss. Whatever. But yeah. anyway, the real question number three is from Sailor from Santa Cruz, California. We've got a lot of California represented today. His question is, I was recently hired by a past employer to design and set up the beverage program for their new restaurant. I did everything from designing cocktails and menus to customizing order forms and par sheets placed their first orders, initial setup of the bar, training staff, and even designed a cocktail cost calculator for the bar manager. Although we have already worked out a deal for compensation, I was wondering what I should charge for this kind of service since I'd like to do more of it in the future. Thanks. I love the podcast. Well, thanks, Sailor. Excellent. Thank you. You could definitely kind of tackle this in the same way you'd kind of price out any consulting project, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'm going to hop in on this yeah, one. Yeah, go ahead. I used to be a real consultant, a real one, not like the ones on TV. So the, the trick here is to know what are you going to do and what won't you do? And the key part of any, starting any consulting project really is communication. So what I would recommend is to write it down. So write out the scope of the project. So just like you listed in your question, you said these 10 things, do the same thing in your proposal. Just a very, very brief write-up. You don't have to go crazy and say, I'm going to do these 10 things and then take a look at each individual item and estimate how long it's going to take you. Then I would recommend to multiply by an hourly rate that you find fair. And I hate to say it, but you should probably add about 30% because things always take longer than you think they will. Oh my God, do they? <laughs> they absolutely. 30% is being optimistic. <laughs> but then I would say that the biggest and most important step is to then take that proposal, go back to the person you're working, potentially working with and communicate, negotiate, et cetera. This is where you have a conversation with them and say, for example, I don't know, staff, I'm going to make something up here. Staff training, let's say, ends up being a huge portion of your budget, a huge portion of your hours. I don't know. Maybe they'll come back and say, you know, I love everything you've done here, but I don't need you to do staff training or something like that. Having it all written down on paper lets you lets you have something to talk to when you're talking about the scope of the project. It lets you sync up with the potential customer or client, I should say, so that you both have the same expectations going in. And frankly, it gives you a tool to estimate how much you should charge based on a reasonable hourly rate. Now, I'm not talking about $6 an hour either. Um, remember, you are a consultant now. And so you should think about it in terms of the, a consultant rate in your 
local city. And this varies so much worldwide. I'm not even sure I can throw out a number, but what I would start to look at is just even go on Craigslist and go into like the services section and look up the word consultant. See what people are charging. It'll give you a ballpark. And shoot, there might even be restaurant consultants in there that you could take a look for pricing as well. But I hope maybe this gives you somewhere to start. Yeah. And I've heard uh, a couple other approaches on this particular uh, subject as well, especially around finding your hourly rate. And that is take the hourly rate you get on a busy Friday night and increase that. So, you know, if you make 400 bucks a night on Fridays or whatever, and you work eight hours, 50 bucks an hour is your hourly rate, add 30% to that. So now you're at 65 and then you can kind of start to calculate out of that. That's kind of a general ballpark of how to approach your price uh, in the beginning. And hopefully that'll give you at least somewhere to start. $1,000. Exactly. And it really is all about communication. Once you have that place to start from, just have the conversation with your client. Make sure you agree on the scope. I can't emphasize that enough. That is so, so important. And then once you agree on the scope, the conversation around pricing will be much easier. Because if you come right out of the gate to your client and say, it's going to be $3,000, they may fall out of their chair. But if you come out and say, okay, here's everything I have in the scope, and you list 25 things, and then you say $3,000, it might feel like a bargain. Yeah. And when I've um, approached clients with this on my end, I'll create brackets of processes. So if it's too much money, then they have the opportunity to say, you know what, I really like this packet right here, but I don't need these services. I can do without those. And you still get some work out of the deal. You get a decent price and you empower them to make a decision on how much they're willing to spend. That's a great point. And actually to piggyback on that, I know you didn't actually ask this question, Sailor, but if I may put in my... uh I would highly recommend that when it comes to pricing your project, that you divide it into pieces. Like we talked about the scope, I would say, you know, depending on the size of the project, if it's a very small project, then maybe there's a deposit up front and final payment at the end. But if it's a large, like what you described sounded like a large project, then I would divide it into phases. Phase one is pre-opening. Phase two is perhaps launch. Yeah, staff training and opening. And then phase three is optimization or something. Each phase will have a list of activities at the scope that's involved and each phase will have an invoice due at the end of it. So what that means is your customer, your client gets to spread out the cost over time and you get to make sure that you're still getting paid along the way without finishing the project, asking for money and not receiving it. That's really good advice and it's definitely worth considering. And it forces a conversation with, you know, if you finish phase one, you go back to your customer and you say, great, I think we finished doing A, B, and C and A, B, and C were on the scope for phase one. How are you feeling about this project? Are you happy? How are things going? It gives you a chance to sync up with your customer and they can come back and be like, you know what? I'm not really sure this is quite what I wanted. Let's do this differently. Right. No, absolutely. It's great advice. Rather than doing a huge project and them just not paying you. Yeah. And it's a really good question. I think this is something that a lot of new consultants will struggle with. And uh, hopefully this will help out a lot of people on their pricing and getting new, uh, new clients. Yeah, definitely. If you are a consultant, new or experienced, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, are we right? Are we way off? I would love to hear maybe some of your advice for pricing your services as well. You don't need to give numbers, but your advice is very welcome. Just go ahead and leave those in the comments at mixologytalk.com slash 104. Perfect. So thanks again for listening to Mixology Talk number 104. We'll have a show over on notes over at mixologytalk.com slash 104. And as always, this is one of our favorite episodes to record. We love listener questions. It really gives us an understanding of kind of what's going on in the industry. So we definitely appreciate all the questions. And in case you haven't heard, we launched our bar tool company a couple of months ago over on Amazon under the name Top Shelf Bar Supplies. So if you're a fan of the podcast or a fan of the bar above and some of the things that we do there, it's a great way to get really great tools and support us and allow us to continue producing material for everyone. So um, if you're looking for new bar tools, definitely head on over to Amazon and look for Top Shelf Bar Supplies. So thank you very much, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Cheers. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.